Well, with no more ado, I want to start with this. Uh, some of you will know what it is, and most of you are probably far too young. This is a still from uh, The Go-Between. It's a very famous film directed by Joseph Losey. It's uh, um, uh, adapted from uh, a great novel uh, of the same title by uh, L.P. Hartley. And uh, I think it makes a very good way to introduce the themes that um, I want to talk to you about today. So but what I need to do first is let me just run through the storyline for the go-between. Before I do that, uh, the two characters on screen are, uh, again, I don't know whether you're too young to know, that's Julie Christie, and this is my favourite British actor, Alan Bates, uh, who often formed a very good duo in, uh, in, in, in films. And you'll immediately see that I've taken a slight liberty with the title of this uh, lecture, because actually this is not a Hollywood film, this is a homegrown English film. Let me, let me do a, a rough outline of the story. This is a story which is uh, told by um, a young uh, boy, he's 12 going on 13, and uh, he stays at a very um, posh house in Norfolk with his friend from school. And they are, an interesting thing about this family is they are, uh, the, 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 the dad is, um, uh, is a banker, he's make, making a mint in the city. The house is actually an old ancestral home of um, the, uh, the Viscount Trimingham. And that's significant. Uh, the boy gets drawn into uh, um, uh, um, a, a sort of game that's, if you like, that he thinks to begin with is a sort of game that's being, being played out. And the word, the name, or the, the description go-between it, it describes this game that he's, he's playing, which is he gets to take messages between these two. Marion, who is the daughter of the house, and Ted Burgess, who is a tenant farmer who lives um, uh, and farms a few miles away. And the, the, the girl, or the, the young woman, in fact, who is charming and resourceful and cunning and everything else, um, inveigles the boy in the nicest possible way into carrying little love notes between the two of them. Now, it's become very apparent why she has to do that in, in, within a, in, a couple of, in a couple of minutes. Um, because her mother, actually, wants her to marry the latest Viscount Trimingham. That is her mo that's her mother's idea. She really feels that this is what must happen. She clearly feels, to some extent, that they are the fa their family are the nouveau riche, and they really want to get married into the British uh, landed aristocracy. Uh, but but uh, Marion has rather other ideas, and in fact has uh, selected Ted Burgess as the bloke uh, she wants to uh, have as her lover, and, and who knows whether she wants him as a, a lifelong partner. One, can never, one can't actually tell that from, from the film. So you've got to keep this, the idea is we're going to have to keep this very secret, so the boy carries the messages to and fro. Um, the, the, the sort of denouement of this is that, that of course, the mum realises what's going on and, in the end, um, catches Marion and Ted Burgess in flagrante in the, uh, in the, the gardens of the, of the large house. And then it's sort of all over, really. Um, Ted Burgess um, goes home and shoots himself. And you think, well, that must be the end of that. The implication is that Marion then marries um, Viscount Trimingham, 
which indeed she does. Now, what's all that got to do with evolution? That's the, that's the question. Um, well, well, we'll see in a moment. The first thing I want to say about it is that this is what you might call a very good example of natural selection, this film. Why natural selection? Well, because Marion selects Ted Burgess and very naturally her mother doesn't like it. Sorry, I'm going to... <laughs> um, and there are two things, um, I think evolutionary things, that, that actually crop up here. The first is that there is this enormous tension between mum and daughter, which people might say, well, that's fairly, that's perhaps not uncommon. Tension between mothers and daughters is, is probably uh, something that, that, that happens. And, and these are some quotes, actually. When they were talking to each other, um, it was like two steel threads crossing each other, grating, for example. Um, the boy was, as he says, conscious of the clash of wills between them. And then he has this rather nice thing here about, did Marion love her? She was, after all, they were mother and daughter. Did Marion love her? I'd seen themselves watching each other like two cats, uh, and there, as cats do, turn away indifferently, as if whatever was at stake between them had, had sort of faded away. So what's that about? I mean, why should there be tension between a mother and a daughter? And the answer, of course, evolution tells you what the answer to that is, because this is genome wars in action. If you are a classical evolutionist of the Richard Dawkins uh, uh, style, then, of course, we, we know that genes, or, or they know, and maybe we know, that genes are in conflict with one another, because what the idea of any gene or any genome, I think now we're all a bit more grown up than we were 30-odd years ago, that genomes are out for themselves. They are trying to, if you like, um, promote their existence into the, into the future. And, of course, the difficulty with a mother and daughter is they share half their genes. So, of course, there's going to be conflict, because... Um, on the one hand, the mother sees the daughter as a way of promoting her genome into the future, but actually the daughter has half her genome, if you like. It's actually come from somewhere else, from her dad. And therefore, I think the scene is set for that sort of conflict. And, and indeed, that is exactly what's being played out in the, in the film. Um, now, um, as I said, the mother wins. The, the mother catches them at it. And Marion marries Viscount Trimingham, who is the ninth Viscount Trimingham. And he has, in, he has a long uh, uh, evolutionary, if you like, or, or line of descent which is tracked in the local church as well, and which the boy, which the boy sees. And I say Ted has gone home, he's shot himself, so Ted is now out of the picture. Except he isn't, of course. Because, because of course, uh, Marion is actually now carrying... Ted's child. So Marion marries the Viscount, but she's carrying Ted's baby. The boy, Leo, comes back many years later, 50 years later, he comes back to the family to see how they're getting on, and there he meets the, the most recent descendant, if you like, who thinks he is the most recent descendant of Viscount Trimingham, but of course he isn't actually. He's a descendant of Ted Burgess, the tenant farmer. So there's the other evolutionary bit about all this. A very clear message, actually, that when evolutionary theorists talk about um, mating opportunities and so on, and what you see here is an actual instance of that, but in a real-life setting. 
And we notice, of course, that the fact that Ted shot himself doesn't matter because he's already had a ch chance to actually pass on his own genes down into Marion and then into posterity, actually. Now, if that's not what evolution is about, I don't know what is. Now, one might ask a question, what is it that Marion sees in Ted Burgess? Um, and who knows? What would evolution say about that? Well, of course, if you go back and look at the two picture, the, the picture of Marion and Ted Burgess, this may seem terribly obvious, really. It's how different, of course, they appear. How different they appear. Now, why does that matter? And why would evolution care about that? Well, of course, evolution might care about it because it somehow, if indeed evolution realises anything, and I'm a bit wary of these uh, anthropomorphic uh, use of ideas, that evolution likes the idea that you can, you've got a very good mix of genes for the next generation. And therefore, perhaps, what underlies that is an idea that Marion chooses somebody whose genes are going to be very, very different from her own. And Ted Burgess, I think one might think, is someone whose genes are likely to be very different from her own. Now, I think that is a, a, an interesting and significant point. So let's move on and see whether I can, I can develop it a bit. Does anyone recognise these two characters? <laughs> Well, I say, if uh, uh, The Go-Between was one of my favourite films, this is certainly another. This is El Cid, 1961. <laughs> Absolute wonderful piece of Hollywood. You, Hollywood doesn't come any better than this, I think. This is Sophia Loren, and this is Charlton Heston. Um, now, let's... OK. This is pretty... Does this bring out the point? OK. Here are two people. How different do you want two people to be, actually? Again... They're two, uh, they're lovers, of course, um, and although their love affair is, is fraught with difficulties all the way along the line. But, you know, look at this bloke and look at her. You know, this is the epitome of classical masculinity, isn't it? And that's the epitome of classical womanhood, I would say. These are two people whose genes, we suppose, could not possibly be any different. So again, here we have the love theme. Now, what about the death theme? We've already seen the death theme once with Ted Burgess killing himself, but nevertheless, it really, in evolutionary terms, not mattering. And in this case, um, one of the things that actually happens in this film early on, which is, of course, is one of the reasons why there's a fair amount of tension in this love affair, is that Charlton Heston kills Sophia Loren's father in a duel. You know, this is not when they invite you round <laughs> to meet the family. This is not something that generally happens, but Charlton Heston does. It's a matter of honour. Her father insults his honour. They have a fight. It's a wonderful fight, actually, if you like wincing violence. It's the first time I ever saw a film where I actually thought that swords were dangerous because they sound like, you know, 20 pounds of sharp steel hitting each other <laughs> rather than something else. Sophia is, who is playing the part of Chimane in this film, and of course Charlton Heston is playing the part of El Cid, El Cid, Cid. Um, she is somewhat upset by the fact that he has killed her father and, you know, makes muttering sounds about... You put your honour before my happiness. And what does he say? A, a tremendously tactful remark he makes. Does anybody remember it? He had outlived the usefulness of his life. <laughs> Evolution or what? It turns out, actually, uh, we sort of know this, that her father is also, or was indeed, the king's champion. <laughs> and... El Cid 
is then moved by the fact that he's killed the king's champion to take his place in the next uh, set to between the king and the neighbouring kingdom. And then we see a tremendous amount of violence <laughs> in one of the most, uh, I think, violent uh, fight scenes that's certainly, remember this is 50 years ago, that's ever been filmed, really. And, um, of course, he wins, and things go on and on. He then attracts, because he's now become a little bit of a threat to the king. He's looking, he's honourable, and, and, and this is, he kills people, right? He kills people. Now, that's very, I think that's very significant. Um, one of the, I suggest, one of the attractive things about Elfid is, actually, he kills people. That means you've got to take him very seriously, I think. Death again, all right? This is the sort of death that we like in Hollywood films. Let's get the, uh, uh, let's get the knights charging across the sand. Um, this is the Christians now riding to... Uh, it's a bit tricky to say this at the moment, but this is going to be a battle between Christians and, uh, and Muslim Moors, actually. I don't think any people remember this. Actually, it's not quite as bad as it sounds, because on the Christian side, there are also some Moors who are fighting with the Christians, and we're really both together fighting against an alien invasion of other Moors. So we've got good Moors and bad Moors in this case. The good Moors are with us, and we're going to knock seven barrels out of the, uh, out of the bad Moors, which indeed we do. Well, again, I mean, the other little thing that people, again, if they've seen this film, will remember is that if you look somewhere up here, just above my hand up there, you'll actually see a flag, and under that flag is El Thid, except that actually in this case, El Thid is dead. He's actually on this horse, he's been killed, but they sit him on his horse, and they, he leads the cavalry. Okay. <laughs> What is this about in evolutionary terms? Well, it seems to me, if you look at the whole scene, this is really about protecting your resources, protecting your territory from outsiders. Because this is, a more, this is reasonably well, I think, uh, anchored in history. And this is when the Moors were actually moving from South Africa, in, from South Africa, from North Africa into Spain, and trying to spread the, uh, the, the Muslim empire into Europe. So naturally, we defend ourselves against them. And actually, the easiest way to defend yourself and defend your genes, if you like, is by killing the enemy. So I mean, here we've got it again. And it reinforces, of course, the, the El Cid myth, really, which is you know, this is a bloke who is actually prepared to kill uh, to protect you. I think that's really quite important. Let's jump on a bit. OK. Another great love story. It's uh, everyone, Bogart and Bacall, of course, and um, um, a girl in a gun. Well, you know, he jumped to film noir of the, I don't know, 1950s, 1960s and so on. It was all a girl and a gun. Um, you know, people actually said that all you needed, in fact, to make a decent film in Hollywood was a girl and a gun, and here they are. And this is a love story on screen and off screen, of course, and uh, again, a girl in a gun. You can take this man seriously. He kills people. He will kill someone for you, you know, if it, if it becomes necessary. Um, why the gun, particularly? Well, it's because we've moved on. He has a gun. Uh, El Cid had a sword. And whatever significance you attach, and no doubt Freud would have attached quite a lot to the, to, the, to the gun, and anybody who's seen Bonnie and Clyde will remember the scene where it's perfectly obvious what the gun is supposed to represent in sexual terms. Need I spell this out for anybody? No. Um, but at the same time, this is a man who is actually prepared to shoot somebody else in order to get his own way, and getting his own way means getting his own way with, with you, the girl. There's a lot about death in Hollywood films. I mean, if love's one is one big theme, 
death is another. Why? Why? Um, and I think it leads us to ask a very good question, actually, is how was death invented? Now, if you're an evolutionary biologist, you say he's taking leave of his senses. I mean, we didn't invent death. It just happens, doesn't it? Um, of course, there are plenty of evolutionary biologists at the moment who are a bit wonder why actually death just happens. I mean, everybody who's looking at the question of ageing, which goes on in this university as well as anywhere else, is interested in the fact as to why, why do um, um, organisms die? Well, you may think it's really rather natural, but the great evolutionary theorist George Williams, of course, said, well, actually, it's a bit strange, quite frankly, because surely any organism that could arrange to, uh, to be conceived, <laughs> develop, be born and live through its life, surely it couldn't be such a big deal to ensure that it had then got immortality at the end of it. Why is it, why is it, such, a big, why is it such a big deal? I think the fact is that that sort of death, as a result of old age, doesn't matter to evolution. Evolution, that's, that's, that's like, you know, you're dying when you've outlived the usefulness of your life. That's the, king, that's the old king's champion, like getting off the scene. But what I really wanted to try and suggest is that sometime in the past, I think human beings actually suddenly somehow... Um, invented the idea of death. I don't mean, I mean, they must have seen their relatives and nearest and dearest dying. Perhaps they actually thought there was an, that this was a bit like if you saw a, you, a dead parent um, or a dead child. Um, it was a bit like seeing a dead animal that you could eat. And indeed, it's interesting, a lot of interesting speculation <laughs> as to whether people did see, see other dead human beings in that light. But around death, we've, we have this enormous, um, we have enormous rituals around death. I mean, what is that actually about? What has it got to do with, with human evolution? Um, and of course, it's been suggested, and I think really quite persuasively, <laughs> that the reason uh, that, that the, as soon as humankind perceived, started to think about this idea of death, that was the moment it actually started to think about the idea of the immortal soul. Um, and indeed, an awful lot of death rituals are really all around, uh, in some sort of sense, trying to propitiate the soul that has now left the body and maybe to stop it getting back into the body at some stage in future. Now, that may or may not be the case. It certainly has been argued very persuasively. And... But the important thing, I think, is that we do attach enormous solemnity to, to death in our society, whether it's individuals, uh, I think, and what we do in terms of, of burial rituals and, uh, and so on. And, and all cultures, all cultures seem to, seem to do this. So that on the one hand, in evolutionary terms, well, it's really neither here nor there, provided it happens at the right time. Does it matter? But actually, for us, it really does matter. And somewhere in our evolutionary past, we started to take this very seriously. I thought I'd just remind, just tell you, I don't know whether anyone's ever seen This is Arthur Miller, playwright Arthur Miller. And he's actually talking about presidents of the United States. And he said, and he points out that one of the basic conditions of the employment of a president is a readiness to kill for us. If you look at the great presidents of the USA, as he points out in his, in his book, um, <laughs> they're all presidents who actually fought wars. Whatever else they did, they may have done jolly good things in all sorts of directions, but the key thing was they fought wars. The second quote is about, is about Truman. Right? And this is really about Truman's decision to drop the atomic bombs on Japan. Now, people have argued the toss about this and why he did it and why he maybe should not have done it until they're black in the face. Arthur Miller says it's because he needed to do it as part of his job. Right. If he'd been unwilling to kill in order to demonstrate the atomic bomb, that would have threatened his leadership 
both personally and symbolically. Now, that, I think if that's true, then that explains really quite a lot about both about the way we live and conduct our life, particularly going and fighting other people. It also, I think, explains really quite a lot about why death, and particularly war, actually, is such a popular theme in, in, in Hollywood pictures. Well, we've done love, we've done death. What about happiness? Well, this is a quote. This is, uh, this is uh, Leo Colston from um, The Girl Between saying, well, he, he had a simple idea of happiness. You got what you wanted and you were happy. What was the big deal? Why was it such a big deal for Marion and Ted and the Viscount and so on? I mean, surely the Viscount would get what he wanted. He'd get the girl and uh, he'd get the house. And, of course, he'd get her dad's money, which was going to be coming pretty handy because he was clearly starting to become a bit impoverished. I mean, that's underlying the whole of the story. So he gets her and he gets the resources and, and so on. <laughs> what this, I think, leads us to, straight from what Leo Colson said, is into the idea of the happy ending. Right. A huge feature of Hollywood is happy endings. Hollywood films have happy endings. Now you'll say, because there'll be a lot of literary people here, will say, well, nothing particularly unusual about that. I mean, all of Shakespeare was happy endings, you know. The playwright, the filmmaker, wants us all to go away thinking, this is good, right? Things have really turned out very well. All the people who matter and who we care about are now happy. And th usually the, the happiness, of course, consists in getting married. And, um, and, and that's good, because you can finish at that point. They get married, and that's good. And they are happy. You, you don't have to think about what happens afterwards. It's a bit like death, you see, actually. The great thing about this, it, the death is, it brings things to a stop there for, uh, in some sense. It puts, a, uh, it puts a, a line across the story. Well, the marriage puts a line across the story as well. And this, does anyone know this scene? <laughs> this is from The Wizard of Oz. This is Dorothy uh, right at the end, waking up in bed in her little hut with all the friends, neighbours and Auntie M around her and say, oh, isn't it great to be back in your own bed in your own house after all those adventures and so on. So there we are, you see. You get what you want and you're happy. Let's look at another film. This is Titanic. Is this a film with a happy ending? Let me tell you what uh, Joe Queenan, who is media, one of the media correspondents for The Guardian, said recently. He looked at the 20 last biggest grossing films that had come out of Hollywood, 20, and he said, actually, only one of them stands out because all the other 19 were happy ending films. But Titanic, of course, isn't because we know it's not going to be a happy ending because we know the story already. But in all the other cases, we didn't know what the story was already. So we know, in the case of Titanic, it's going to be an unhappy ending because the boat's going to go down or the ship's going to go down. But when it starts off, this is a dream of happiness, isn't it? This is people going to America, it's emigrants going from Ireland or wherever to start a new life, and, and the whole thing is opening up for them. And this is the flight of fancy, isn't it? This is uh, um, Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio standing at the front of the boat, sort of flying as the ship ploughs towards the iceberg uh, somewhere in the, in the distance. I think to perhaps notice about this, which I'll just draw attention to. That is, it's quite interesting to compare Leonardo, Di the way Leonardo DiCaprio looks in this film. He is the hero, he is the heartthrob, he is the love and sex interest with uh, Charlton Heston, actually. <laughs> you know, the, these two people are not so different, actually, in the way they look, uh, as with Charlton Heston and Sophia Loren. Uh, it's interesting. You can see this trend, actually, within uh, who are Hollywood heartthrobs over the last 50, 60 years. There is a trend, there's no doubt about that. It has been suggested the reason behind that <laughs> is the contraceptive pill. Because it doesn't matter now. You're not, you're not so concerned about sex as procreation. It's now become recreation. And so the genes don't matter so much, do they? You can go for something else, some other quality in the, in the hero that you didn't have before. 
Well, then we have the cataclysm. Okay, now we've got struggle. Here are the here are hero and heroine struggling through the floods, um, and um, mm, well, we know the ship's going down, but this is good. This shows you, you know, they are struggling together, and I think that's uh, again that's an important part of the Hollywood uh, myth or scene or whatever. And this is the future. What happens in the future? Well, was the going down of the ship <laughs> the unhappy ending? Certainly, Leonardo is, you know, in a sense, it's pretty unhappy in one sense because, of course, Leonardo DiCaprio drowns and we see him disappearing into the icy depths of the North Atlantic. But, of course, from the heroine's point of view, it's not, is it? Because, actually, his death and the ship going down releases her into a new life. She actually then becomes this sort of pioneering, go-getting woman. She learns to fly, she rides horses, she you know, drives in the uh, Mille Emilia, and all the kinds of things that, because women always want to do, I guess, but which blokes did, but women would like to do, and she does it, right? Uh, now, I think that, again, is quite... <laughs> so, actually, this film... <laughs> I think this film does have a happy ending, despite what Joe Greenan said. just depends on your perspective, of course. Another theme, of course, is Maiden in Distress. Anyone recognise who this is? This is Faye Dunaway, and this is Faye Dunaway in Chinatown. And here she is, she's Evelyn Mulray, and she's doing what people always do in these private eye films. Um, she's got a problem, she's looking for a private eye to help her out. And, of course, the point of the film is <laughs> that immediately everything gets out of hand. That's what makes the film interesting. In what ways does it get out of hand? I mean, you've not, when you start watching the film, you haven't got a clue what this film is actually going to be about. What it does turn out to be about are the three themes again. You know, it's about love and sex, and it's about death, and it's about the pursuit of, of very much the pursuit of happiness. Why is this? Well, here are the two, you know, here are the two male protagonists. If she's the female protagonist, these are the two male protagonists. That's John Houston playing her father. And this is uh, uh, Jack Nicholson playing the private eye, Jake. All right. And there's a good question here about, I think, villains and, and heroes. Well, there's not much doubt as to who the villain is in this film. It's her dad. He's a jovial old buffer, but he has two skeletons in his cupboard. The first is that actually he's been busy subverting the city council and everybody else in order to provide growing Los Angeles with water in a completely dishonest way. Uh, he is, you know, he's a billionaire by their standards, but this is how he's doing it. This isn't some honest broker. This is a bloke who does what he sees he's got to do in order, uh, and he says at some point, to secure the future, actually. The future is what this is all about. He's a, he's a villain in another way, because actually it turns out that Evelyn Mulray has a daughter. And in fact, the film rotates about Evelyn Mulray and her daughter and who the father of the daughter is. It's John Houston, of course. It's her father, it's also the father of her daughter. So there's a nice blackness creeps into this, into this film, actually at this point, suddenly it becomes something else, because actually evolution on the whole is against that kind of thing, actually. If you think about evolutionary terms, it doesn't want fathers to, fa uh, to father children by their daughters for good evolutionary reasons, one would guess, if that's the, where the influence comes from, because that's, in that way you actually lead to uh, homozygous conditions in people uh, in, the, in the next generation who may suffer from serious illness, both mental and, and physical. In any case, we don't like that kind of thing. That really is very, you know, I think everyone sort of drew their breath in sharply when they actually realised that that's what this film was about. And it gets worse, in the sense that at the end, he, of course, gets off scot-free, he goes on living his life, becoming richer and richer and richer and getting away with it, and the daughter is shot dead in a police shootout. It's a <laughs> is that a happy end? Well, is it or not? You know, it's a good question. Um, 
because it, this is in a sense discussed by these two in the middle. <laughs> you know, what's it all about, says, uh, says uh, uh, Jack. Um, you know, what was it all for? And of course, John says, well, it's all about the future, lad, isn't it? It's about the future. That's what we're all here for. So, again, depending on if it were an evolutionary point of view, you'd say, well, that's a pretty happy end, actually. You've got a good result there, frankly. Just because love may lead to marriage, as indeed it very often does, although a lot less these days than it used to once upon a time, I gather, it also leads to divorce. <laughs> One of the great themes of Hollywood, again, I don't know whether people have noticed this, is the idea of divorce as comedy, actually. If you're looking for a comedy, if you're looking for divorce as comedy in a Hollywood film, you can't do better than, than this, His Girl Friday. Have we seen this film? It's a great cast again. It's Cary Grant in this case and Rosalind Russell. And, in fact, Russell and Cary Grant work for a newspaper. Uh, she's a, a crack reporter and he's an editor. And they work together in this newspaper, but they're divorced. And the film's actually all about, and she is married again, the chap on, he, over here on the right, that's her present husband. The film is actually about how Cary Grant is going to get her back and away from her present husband. And it's fairly hilarious, I think, as films go. And it's the devices he uses to separate her from her husband, actually, which make the film very funny. Actually. Because he, he actually he's, he devises any number of ways to keep her out of the way, doing the job but making sure that she's with him and not with her husband. And what it says above here, this is David Thompson. I took this quote from his uh, The Whole Equation, The History of Hollywood, as he says, a very tricky inquiry into a love's need for a chase or a dream and the sharpest pointer to uncertain gender roles. Who is driving this? Is it Cary Grant? Is it Rosalind Russell? Right. You're back with Darwin, aren't you? This whole thing about sexual selection. Oh, well, it's women who do the choosing, isn't it? Or one half of it. Very, when Darwin suggested that, of course, wasn't, didn't go down terribly well, I think, with, the, uh, the, with his colleagues who thought that, well, surely, I mean, we can cope with evil, but women choosing who they want to marry? I don't think so. That's just one step beyond what we can cope with. I want to finish off with something else. Um, Hollywood, of course, it may have these great themes. And, of course, one of the, th one of the things about, uh, about this idea of pursuit of happiness is that, of course, what evolution says is that, that it's played a trick on us. We, we, we are born thinking that we somehow deserve happiness and we can have it. And so we pursue it. But of course what evolution has done rather cunningly is to make sure that what you think might make you happy are things that promote evolutionary success. So actually, most of these films, although they have happy endings, the interesting thing about them is what happens before the happy ending. It's the struggle that goes on and the conflict and this is what makes it entertaining and, and, and not bland and so on. Right. But the final thing I wanted to, just this final point I wanted to make for you is... <laughs> that, of course, Hollywood's actually about acting. I mean, that's really what it's about. It's about people acting out, f essentially, fantasies for our entertainment. And remember this, actually. I don't know who said this, but I always think it's very true. Language is God's gift to liars. You know, that underpins acting as well as anything else, it seems to me as well as anything could do. At least it did once the talkies came in. But of course it's not just Hollywood where people act. What about politicians? Politicians act. Um, again, this is, this is uh, um, uh, Arthur Miller again. It's not news that we move from, move far more by our glandular reactions to a leader's personality his acting um, than by his proposals or by his moral character and so on. 
the overlap between, say, politics and, and Hollywood is enormous. Why was Ronald Reagan, who in one sense supposed to have been a really bad president, tremendously successful president? Because he could act, actually. He was a professional actor. He could act the part out. Uh, you know, he could act what he thought presidents ought to look like for the great mass of the American people, I think. One final thing, right? I chose this, <laughs> I also chose the film, The Girl Between, for another reason, which is that the opening words of the book actually are the past is a foreign country, they do things differently there. Do they? No, of course, evolution says, of course they don't. The whole point about evolution is what you do now is what you did then. It's always the same, isn't it? <laughs> That's why we behave like we do now, because of the way they behaved like they did then. That's all, folks. Thank you.